about an important topic. You know, we've been talking about all year about the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about all year about what the Holy Spirit's desire is for us. And today I want to talk about a difficult topic for some people. I want to talk about what the Holy Spirit wants us to do with shame. Shame is a hard word. Shame is a word we don't like to talk about. Shame is a word that makes us uncomfortable. Shame is a word that leaves us feeling degraded. Shame, shame is a word that each of us have a connection to in some way. I mean, we each have something we're ashamed of. Now, whatever you're ashamed of, don't say it out loud. But take a moment and just realize that we're all in the same condition. We're all in the same boat. We all have something that we either are currently ashamed of or have been ashamed of or, or we never want anyone to ever find out about us. You know. I like this image because it's like this guy, he, he puts this bag over his head because he doesn't want anyone to know who he is, right? And, and, and we've all felt that way at times, haven't we? we we've all felt like, I, I just don't want anyone to know what my sin is. I, I don't want anyone to know what I've done. It's like, what is shame? Shame is like guilt. Shame is a type of guilt. Let's put it that way. Shame is a type of guilt, but it's, it, it's more. It's, it's guilt on steroids. You see, guilt has a purpose, and that purpose is to bring you to repentance. That purpose is to bring you to, to, to conviction. You know, even God can use guilt and does use guilt to bring us to a point of repentance. But shame is a different type of guilt. It's still guilt, but it's guilt on steroids, like I said. Shame is guilt plus the fear or the reality of others knowing about your guilt. Like We come to church and and we, we preach verses like, and we talk about verses like, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we say verses like, there is none righteous, no, not one. And then we shame people. And we embarrass them. Because they have some problem in their past. They have some problem in their life. They, they have something they're maybe still working on. They have something maybe they worked on and it's over. But some people won't let it go. They, they just want to point it out all the time. But the very same people who have no problem pointing out your shame, the very same people who have no problem pointing out your guilt on steroids, the very same people will be the people who will quote in Sabbath school, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no flesh, no, not one that is righteous. It's like either you believe what the Bible says or you don't, but, 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 but you, you, you can't have this theology of brokenness because of the fall, and then not let people heal. Notice what I'm saying. I'm not saying that people should stay broken. I'm saying people should heal. It's like shame is guilt plus the fear that other people are going to point out your guilt. And I found this picture, <laughs> and it's benign but funny, <laughs> to illustrate what shame is. This poor dog ate the face off of this elephant, <laughs> this stuffed elephant. So, so they make this dog wear the stuffed elephant's face now. Like, if you're going to eat his face, you're going to be his face. And then they write this little sign that says, I chewed the face off this stuffed elephant. And they take his picture and they publicly shame him. And we're laughing at it. Poor dog, right? And you know, I don't have a problem laughing at a shamed dog. But I have a problem of laughing about the shame of a broken person who Jesus hung on a tree for. 
Shame is guilt plus the fear that someone's going to find out. Shame is guilt plus the fear that someone's going to point it out. Shame is guilt plus public awareness. And you know what I found out? I found out that it doesn't even have to, you can have shame without anyone even pointing it out. Sometimes it's just the fear that someone might. Sometimes it's just the idea that someone could find out. And, and sometimes you, 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 you can be the one who shames yourself. Did you know that? Like no one else may know about the situation and, and you're taking care of it with God, but, but you're just beating yourself up every single day. It's you who's pointing the finger. It's like, you bad person. You know? I remember I was working in this group home when I was doing um, social work. I was working in this group home, mental health. It, it was a mental health group home. And I was working in the office one night. And I don't know who designed this group home. It was crazy. But, but the office was, was in the basement of a residential home, right? So this... People with all kinds of mental health issues living in the home. And someone thought it was a bright idea to put the office for the staff in the basement where you couldn't see anything. There were no windows. and You go into this room and you can't see anything past what's on the other side of the door. And, and there's this knock at the door. And uh, I'm like, yeah, what's going on? And it's one of the residents. He's like, you got to come upstairs. You got to come upstairs right now. You know, and when you're dealing with people with various mental illnesses, you got to wonder is, you know, is their emphasis <laughs> called for or is this part of a delusion or, or, or so forth? I'm like, well, what's going on? He's like, the police are here. I'm like, oh, I'm getting fired tonight. What happened? So I go upstairs and, you know, like think about a residential house. You go up the stairs, you open the door and it's nighttime. And I open the door, and the door isn't fully open. And I see blue lights flashing all through the house from the front windshield. And I walk into the living room, I look out the window, and it's like I walked onto a set of a Hollywood movie. It's like suddenly I'm either in Lethal Weapon or Law and & Order or the mixture of both. And I open the screen door on the front porch, and it's just like in a movie. A cop grabs me, and he says, come on, come on, come on. And he runs me back to the cruiser, right? And he's got the door open, and, they're like, and I'm like, what is going on? They're like, do you know Calvin? Calvin's not his real name, by the way. Do you know Calvin? I'm like, yeah, I know Calvin. Why? What's going on? He's like, he's held up in the garage. I'm like, Calvin? Like, I know Calvin. They don't, obviously. They were, they, they, they've called it a, a, the fire department. They've called it the police department. You know, for Calvin? I'm like, well, who cares if Calvin's in the garage? They're like, no, 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 no. He called 911. I'm like, Calvin called 911? That's... That's odd. What's that about? Is it true that Calvin is a paranoid schizophrenic? I'm like, sure. That is what we do here. <laughs> well, Calvin called 911 and he said that he has weapons and that he's a paranoid schizophrenic and he doesn't know what's going to happen next. I'm like, oh, Calvin, come on. <laughs> They're like, no, 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 no. I'm like, let's go. Let's go to the garage. Let's talk to Kelvin. <laughs> They're like, you can, you can, you know, come, come. I'm like, no. It's Calvin. So we walk to the garage. I open the door. All these police are surrounding me like I'm going to be killed. And Calvin's just this harmless guy. And He's just sitting on this lawn chair in the garage and he's got a duffel bag underneath him. So please start freaking out at me. What's underneath him? What's underneath him? And, <laughs> and we go barging in this garage and he's holding up his hand. He's saying, I did it. I did it. I did it. And the police are freaking out because he's sitting on this chair with this duffel bag yelling, I did it. I did it. I did it. And they're like, you did what? I'm like, just everybody just calm down. Like, I, everyone just calm down. No one shoots anyone. Let's just talk this through. Calvin, what did you do? He says, it's really bad. Calvin? It's really bad, Vince. 
Calvin, tell the officers what you did. In 1984, I didn't pay my taxes. If someone's going to find out, and they're going to come for me, and they're going to lock me up, the cold one, Vince, the cold one, they're going to lock me in the cold one, Vince. Calvin, what did you do? I called 911. Why? Because I didn't pay my taxes in 1984, and they're going to find out. I'm like, Calvin, did you tell them you have weapons, and you didn't know what was going to happen? And he's like, it's true. I'm like, Calvin, what's in the duffel bag? Oh, just my clothes for when I go to jail. <laughs> Why did you tell them there's weapons, Calvin? All I know, Vince, is I was on the phone with 911, and they asked me, are there any weapons in the house? And so I'm right there in the kitchen, and I see the knives every place. So I'm in jail. I don't know what's going to happen. Am I going to be in the newspapers? I didn't pay my taxes in 1984. So Calvin, this is all going on because you wanted to confess something that you did in 1984? And now the cops are like, they're like doing what you're like. Okay. <laughs> you know, meanwhile, like the whole front, like I'm getting fired tomorrow. This is going to be on the news. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's like lethal weapon meets law and order. And the cop comes up to Calvin. He's like, listen. Do you promise that you will always pay your taxes from now on? And Calvin's like, always. I will never forget to pay my taxes. We're going to let you go with a stiff warning, young man. And just like that, everyone exited my garage. Everyone exited the, the facility. And everyone went home. But you see, Calvin's problem was not what he did in 1984. Calvin's problem was he never stopped blaming himself for what he did in 1984. And sometimes it's a big thing, and sometimes it's a little thing, and it really doesn't matter if you can't let it go. So there was this apostle, his name was the Apostle Paul, and unlike Calvin, he had committed some crimes that were a little bit more serious than not paying your, your taxes. He had persecuted the Christian church. He had murdered the deacon Stephen. He had arrested many Christians. And, and, and he couldn't let it go himself either. He had deep shame about it. He had this deep hurt about it. So much so that for a while he went blind and had to be healed from it. You know what? For the rest of Paul's life, people followed him around saying, you're Paul the Judaizer. You know, even disciples, it took 14 years for them to build a relationship with him. It's like, he went to Jerusalem, they're like, you should check out Damascus. <laughs> he went to Damascus and he ended up leaving there over the wall at night because they tried to kill him. Like, people would not let him forget what he had done. And sometimes it's that way. Sometimes we won't let ourselves forget what we've done. And sometimes other people won't let us forget what we've done. And it really doesn't matter to me which one you're struggling with. If it's that others won't let you let it go or you won't let you let it go, the solution is the same. Paul says in Romans 1, chapter 15, I am what? I am eager to what? To preach the gospel. To who? To you who what? Are in Rome. Are in Rome. Paul is eager because of what happened to him, because of his sin, because of his shame, because of his past. He is eager because he's received salvation to go and give that salvation to other people who are burdened down with other levels of shame, other levels of guilt, and other levels of struggle. He is like, I am free and I'm going to set others free. 
I can't change what I did in the past, but I can change what I do in the present. I can't change what I did in the past, but I can change what I'm going to do in the future. You see, because in Paul's future, he's going to meet Stephen at the resurrection, and Stephen is going to ask, Paul, what are you doing here? Paul is preparing an answer. I was changed by Jesus on the road to Damascus. And not even what I did to you, Stephen, matters. If the Jesus you died for changed me. See, we all have things we need to let go of. You know, because if you don't let go of them, they drag you back in. We all have things we have to just give to God and, and worry about the present and worry about the future and build the present and build a future with Jesus. And the way you get rid of your shame is to help set other people free from shame. See, Paul is eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. And let me tell you something. He knows that if he goes to Rome, he's going to die there. And he is. They're going to chop his head off. You know what I'm saying? Got your head on the chopping block? <laughs> That's what's going to happen to Paul because he doesn't care. This is the evidence that Jesus has changed him. The evidence that Jesus has changed him is his need to set them free is greater than his need to survive from setting them free. And that's going to be his defense to Stephen. Not that he needs to give a defense to Stephen, but you can't blame Stephen for wondering what Paul's doing there. The good news is Paul's going to be able to point to someone from Rome and say, that's why I'm here. Because Jesus used you to change me that I could change him or her. And so Paul goes on in one of the most famous verses in Paul's writings, verse 16. We all know this one. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, but also to the... Do you know this one? It doesn't sound like you know this one. Read this one with me. For I... Come on, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for what? For salvation to who? To everyone who what? believes, to the Jew first and then to the, to the Greek, okay? So Paul says, I am not ashamed. Why is Paul not ashamed? Because of the gospel. The gospel sets you free of your shame. And what is the power of the gospel? It's the power of God. And what is that power for? Salvation. And what does that salvation Depend on believing. For who? Everyone. First the Jew, then the Gentile. First those who already know God, then those who are still coming into a relationship with God. Okay, so Paul puts all of those ideas together in verse 16 that we just read. And he says, for I am not ashamed. I, I have done treacherous things. I have gotten letters from the synagogue to arrest Christians. I have barged into to, to synagogues and broke up places of worship. I have scourged Christians with whips across their back. I have had them arrested and sent to the Pharisees in Jerusalem. I myself arranged for the murder of Stephen. But I am not ashamed because it doesn't matter about who I was. Amen. For the gospel. For the gospel is the power of God. For the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and what? Also to the Greek. 
Paul doesn't stay in Jerusalem. Paul is the apostle of the... Yeah, sure, uncircumcised, that's good. Gentiles, Greeks, whatever. whatever. He is the apostle to the unconverted. You know, some of us are called to nurture converted people, and, 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 and some of us are called to nurture people who are not converted. And, and Peter stayed and became the apostle to the Jews, and, and Paul went out and became the apostle to the Gentiles. And, and you have to have Jews to make Gentiles believers. And I don't mean literal Jews. You have to have believers to make other people believers, right? So Paul goes on to say in verse 17, he goes on to say, For it is the righteousness of God which is revealed from what? From faith for faith, as it is written. The righteous, or in the King James, the just, shall live by faith. How do they live? By faith. From faith to faith, by faith. As it is written. Where is it written? It is written in Habakkuk. It's written in Habakkuk 2. In Habakkuk 2, this is where Paul is taking this statement from. And in Habakkuk 2, it's got to do with God's justice needing to come onto the earth because of the violence Habakkuk sees. And Habakkuk basically is cry, crying out to God and saying, how am I going to live in this condition? How am I going to live? And, and God answers back to Habakkuk, the just, the righteous. They don't do it because they're swift. They don't do it because they're strong. They don't do it because they're mighty. They don't even do it because they're, uh, you know, super dedicated. They do it because they live from faith to faith. It's the only way. It's the only way. So it is written all the way back in Habakkuk, all the way back in the Old Testament. Paul will repeat it twice, and Hebrews will say it once. And if you believe Paul wrote Hebrews, eh, that's kind of, depends on who you talk to. Paul said it three times. But three times, once in Galatians, once in Romans, and once in Hebrews, this phrase is used from Habakkuk. It's an Old Testament idea. The idea is the only way to be free, the only way to be free from shame, the only way to be free from guilt, the only way to be free from your past, the only way to be made righteous, the only way to be justified is by what? Faith. By faith. It's that faith that changes us. So as I was thinking about this idea you know, I'm thinking about it, it kind of goes like this. I, I have shame, but, but the cross destroys my shame. Why? Because Jesus bore my shame on the cross. Jesus took my shame on the cross. Let me tell you, the cross was a whole lot more shameful than the sanitized versions that we talk about in churches. For the sake of children and people weak of stomach. Jesus took my shame, destroyed it at my cross. And if I'm like Paul, that leaves me wanting to live a life of what? Praise and service. What did he say in verse 14? It's because of this that I want to go preach the gospel to the Romans. Because of what? This. Jesus took his shame. And Jesus destroyed his shame. And now Paul wants to destroy shame wherever it is. Speaking of shame, I mean, there's been a lot of shame. I mean, we we were sitting here worshiping, and and and, and we were just going on as normal when 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 very shameful things were happening just down the road from us. 
We had no idea. At least I didn't because I wasn't checking my phone on Sabbath. Maybe, maybe you're all like, oh, well, Charlottesville is in trouble. But I was just having another Sabbath. And some of the most shameful things that has happened in my lifetime were happening. They are shameful. I mean, they're so shameful, there can't be an excuse for them. They're so shameful that, 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 that you have to call them shameful. I mean, they're so shameful. I mean, in America, I, I know it's happened before, I know it's not the first time, but, but for not to be outright called shame, for the, the to be discussion about the Nazi flag being paraded as if it's not something that we have to be ashamed. I know it's happened before. It's shameful. It's also not different than what Paul did to the Christian church. It's actually who Paul was to the Christian church. And it causes this tension in me. It causes this problem in me because on, on one hand, I want to be angry. And I, 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 you, you know, I, I want to be a part of that kickback that, that is angry about what happened. And I, and, and I just, you know, I, I just like, I don't want to have any sympathy for these people. Because I see what their ways produce. I see what their ways make. But on the other hand, the problem is that's not what changes the world. That's their way. You know, I, I think about Heather here. I, I, I think about her. I think about things I've heard people say about her since it's happened, but, but, but for me, I, I'm just in awe that this, this young girl died fighting Nazis in America. Seventy years after the end, almost seventy years after the end of World War II. It bothers me, and it makes me angry. But I think Heather's mother said it best. Heather's mother said, they tried to kill my child so they could shut her up. But you just magnified her. They tried to kill my child to shut her up. But what they did was magnify her message. Paul tried to kill Stephen and succeeded to shut him up, literally. And look what Paul did afterwards. I don't know how I balance this. I don't know how I, I, I take my anger and I take my rage and I balance it with this sense of God's power to bring good out of it. But the story, my friends, are not over yet. I don't mean the fact that CNN and Fox News and MSNBC and the BBC are not going to let this go for as long as they, they can. I mean that we've been fundamentally changed as a nation on individual levels that stories will be told about for years to come. In some ways, I wonder if something like this won't, in the long term, not make as much of an impact on who our collective identity is as 9-11 did. All I know that as a Christian, I got my own shame. And I know that I also share this same shame 
That is why I'm not a white nationalist nor a Nazi. I'm not even an American. I live here. I claim this place. This place so far claims me. So I also share the shame because I have a responsibility to make it better. One thing I know is force does not make it better. This is what the mayor of Charlottesville said. He said, when you dance with the devil, you don't change the devil, the de devil changes you. That's what the mayor of Charlottesville said, talking to CNN after the event. He's like, look, don't let this make you bitter. Don't let this destroy your will. Don't let this make you strike back. He's like, we can't dance with the devil. Because when we dance with the devil, the devil changes us. So what do we do? We have to realize that the cross destroys our shame. And we have to find a way to go forward and preach the gospel. Even to Rome. And in this case, Rome may not be a literal place, but, but, but Rome may be a place that wants to kill me. Rome may be a place that takes me to the edge of my life. Rome is probably like it was for Paul, someone that is only going to listen to him because they've taken him captive. But our goal has to be not to belittle, not to destroy, not to dance with the devil, but to find a way to heal because you've been healed. You have been healed. Jesus is coming. That healing will be complete. The question is not how many of them are we going to get before they get us? The question is, how many of them could be fundamentally changed from what happened? To become better than us. Maybe even to be the next Paul. Lead us, Mark. Seeking the Lord's tears, kindly retreat under the Come unto me, his vision repeating, words of the master speaking today. Go we now find a golden mountain, bringing the world, bringing the world back again. Into the full into the of my redeemer, Jesus, the name for sin as Singing the lost and wanting to Jesus, so that the weak must have the soul. Leading them forth the grace of salvation, showing the pattern life ever born. Going afar, the hope they want, bringing the one It's crazy out there. I'll give you that. 
But I'm going to tell you, it's going to get more crazy. And we can't lose our mission. We can't lose our focus. There are dark times coming. We know it from Bible prophecy. We're going to have homecoming. We're going to talk about Bible prophecy. There have been dark times, there are going to be dark times. It's always dark as before the dawn. We can't let hate destroy love. Because Nazism wins if hate destroys love. What is coming? The power that is about to be unleashed in this world far surpasses when we dropped the A-bomb in Japan. This time is going to be ended according to Daniel chapter 2 by a stone cut out without human hands who is going to be the Lord himself, the rock of ages. And he is going to strike this earth and take his followers back like never before. This is not a time to get into a pose of self-defense. This is a time to make our walks and our call and our assurance right with Jesus so that our hearts will be filled with love so that we can love people who hate us because you know it might be easy for me to say it because I'm a Caucasian but it's coming for me as much as it's coming for you. None of us who claim Christ are going to be able to hide from the hate that's coming upon this world. Jesus said, and this is one we will talk about in our prophecy seminar, Jesus said the love of many will grow cold. And that is what we're seeing. This is the time that if we're not a follower of Jesus, we need to become a follower of Jesus. This is the time that we've not committed ourselves to baptism. We need to commit ourselves to baptism. This is the time. If we're not committed to daily prayer and we're not committed to daily Bible study, it's time to do it because we don't know what's next. But we do know the love of many is growing cold. It's going to keep growing. Let us be found making right decisions. Your card has a place to become a follower. Your card has a place to make a decision for baptism. Your card has a place to study Bible studies if you don't know what you should believe about the Bible. This is the moment. This is the time to start making those decisions because I was here preaching to you seven days ago not knowing what was happening just down the road. Let us secure decisions so that we can reach those who still need to be reached before time runs out. Give us one more verse, Mark. Thus I would go, which is the mercy, following Christ from day on to day, sharing God with the sea with our heart. Pointing the lost to Jesus the way Going up above the the Bringing the wandering back again Into the void of my redeemed Jesus, the man, for sin is Dear Heavenly Father, I want to ask and I want to pray that you release us from our guilt, that you release us from our shame, that you release us from our trespasses, 
that you release us from past sin and that you release us from current sin. Father, I want to pray that there would be a revival in this church like we have never seen before. Father, I want to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit in this church like we have never seen before. Father, I want to call upon your Spirit to come down upon us in mighty ways. Father, I want to ask your Spirit to open up our congregation to going and seeking the lost, going and finding those who have gone astray, going and finding even those in spiritual Babylon that you still call your people. But Father, we got to let go of our past. We got to let go of our shame. We got to let go of our grudges. We got to let go of our hurts. We got to let go of our pain. Because if we can't let go of that, we'll never be able to set other people free of that. So Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be strong upon this congregation and not leave our sight. I pray that the Spirit would haunt us day and night. Turning our minds to Scripture, turning our minds to scenes in our mind of the coming of Christ. So Father, the world is already in a place that the only way it's going to be changed is by Christians who love you. So help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.